Hey, y'all, this is T. Graham Brown. Hey, Pittsburgh. Today's Nashville is coming up, baby. You have been born for a higher purpose. Move forward to what God is calling you to do. The newest inductee of the Grand Old Opry T. Graham Brown began his musical journey in 1973 while attending the University of Georgia in his hometown of Athens. After moving to Nashville in 1982, the Grammy-nominated CMA Award songwriter took the country music by storm. Today, the soulful voice of T. Graham Brown has been heard all over the country music airwaves. He's been entertaining his fans with his bluesy hits, I Tell It Like It Used To Be, and his number one song, Hell and High Water. But God had to slow him down to work out a few of his own high water challenges. This is his story. This is Today's Nashville. This is Faith, part two. T. Graham, here we are again. Yes, ma'am. I am thrilled to sit down and talk to you. Well, thanks for having me, Terry. You've had a lot going on since I've talked to you last. And you know what? I have to say this. We had so many people contact us um, when we interviewed you a couple years ago. Why did you not have T. Graham sing? I tell it like it used to be. When you were still in love with me Before you got too used to me And wanted someone new Well, I tell it like it ought to be Cause how it is is killing me When they ask about you and me I tell it like it used to be How's that? That is what they are gonna be so happy. Thank you. You're welcome. So what has been going on since we've talked last? Boy, a lot of stuff. You know, we're still out touring, doing that. I'm uh, into my Sirius XM show almost six years now. Got a new album. I went down to Muscle Shoals and recorded a 60s soul tribute album. I used to walk around in the 60s. I had a transistor radio. A lot of people don't even know what that is now. I had a little transistor radio that ran off one of those square nine volt batteries. I had it glued to my ear everywhere I went, listening to 1960s, you know, pop hits, pop radio, and they would play a lot of soul songs. And so I've just been working on that. I always wanted to do it and really never had the time or didn't take the time. So I went down to Muscle Shoals, Alabama to Fame Studios and used all those great players from down there. And we cut 14 songs and I started calling it. Yeah, I was talking to Dwight Yoakam on the phone and we stay in touch. And he was asking me what I'd been up to. And I told him I went down and cut a soul, 60 soul tribute album. And he asked me if I had done this song called I'm Your Puppet. And I said, yeah, matter of fact, I did. And he said, can I sing on it? And I said, wow, yeah, you can sing on it. So he went in a studio out in Hollywood, California and sang harmony and did a duet with me on it. It turned out great. So I got to thinking I cut an Al Green song. It's called From Memphis to Muscle Shoals. So I recorded songs that were either originally recorded in Memphis or originally recorded in Muscle Shoals. 
So there was an Al Green song on there called Take Me to the River, and I thought, man, you know Winona would sound great on this. So I called her up, and she did it. And then I thought, and I called Tanya Tucker up, and she did it. And then I called Sam Moore from Sam and Dave. He's 87 years old, seems like he's 20. And he did it, and little Anthony from Little Anthony and the Imperials is on it, and uh, Eddie Floyd, a great soul song or soul singer from Memphis, is on it. Um, Delbert McClinton is on it. It's just turned into kind of so a, when is it coming? When, when is it coming out? It's going to come out in May, I think, it's May or June. They're starting to release tracks from it now. You know, on the how long is it taking? Internet? to put it all together? Golly, I think probably two years, two years to get it just like, it, the heart, where we had it done basically till I started making these phone calls to get duet partners and then that kind of made it, it just took longer that way. But it's coming out and it's all good, all in God's time and it's, Going to be something. It's going to really be exciting. And congratulations, to. the new inductee of the Grand Old Opry. Yay! Isn't that great? Wasn't, I was so happy. I saw it, it was everywhere. That's the biggest thing that's ever happened to Sheila and I. That's the biggest. Tell me about thing. the day when you found out, or did you know that it was going to happen? I mean, no, I didn't know. I mean, I wasn't surprised. I, I just thought. Oh man, it turned. There was this kind of elaborate. Um, they orchestrated this thing. Um, the Opry apparently called the Sirius XM folks in New York, and the New York guys called me and asked if I'd like to interview Vince for 30 minutes for the my live wire show. I said, yeah, man. So there's a new Sirius XM studio in the AT&T building, the Batman building, we call it, you know. So they have a live event, music venue in there, and they say, we're going to have a live audience for this. You interview Vince, you all sing a couple, and we'll use it for your live wire show. And I said, yeah, good, good. And so Vince came down, and his uh, assistant or publicist or somebody, right-hand person was there, and his manager showed up that I hadn't seen in 40 years. And we were waiting in the green room, Sheila and I, and we were all sitting around and came time. They told me I had 30 minutes and Vince had to go somewhere else. So we're sitting in there and talking. We did 30 minute interview, yakking back and forth and singing. And so I was watching this clock on the wall and it got past 30 minutes. I remember it was three minutes. It was 33 minutes. And I thought, man, I got to end this interview so Vince can leave. And I, it was basically like, well, that's all the time we got, Vince. Thanks for coming by and all. And he went, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. I wanted to ask you something. How many times have you done the Grand Ole Opry? And I told him. and he How said, many times? Do you th 300 oh, and something. I know. It's been a bit. And um, he said, well, I got to tell you something. This whole thing has been a setup. Uh, the Opry asked me to come and and asked if you'd like to be the newest member of the Grand Ole Opry. And I went, oh, bull. That was my <laughs> reaction because I thought he was kidding because we're 40-year friends, and he's a really, he's got a great sense of, you know, he's a kind of a jokester, prankster kind of guy. And I thought he was pulling my leg, you know. And then he said, no, man, I'm serious. And I started crying. It was just the best it's the biggest thing that's ever happened to us in our career. And you know, I tell people this, and it's the God's honest truth. The best part of it has been seeing Sheila so happy because we've worked so hard. We've you endeavored to persevere, and we've gone through all this crazy ups and downs, and we're still standing, and... Now we're members and God of the is Grand just, I know, Opry. and he's Man, just blessing just... you so much. And we're going to talk about those ups and downs in your life on the road when we come okay. back. Yeah. See, Graham, do you remember the very first time you sang at the Opry? Well, it's been 40 years ago. I can't, you know, somebody else asked me that. And I can't, I really can't exactly remember it. 
I can't remember who introduced me or any of that. What's it like to go on the stage every time? Is the it's excitement the most still awesome there? It's the awesome thing. It's, it's uh, hard to describe. I'll be standing in that circle out there, and sometimes I'll tell the crowd, I wish y'all could feel what it feels like standing on this stage. It's, it's the only place, basically, that I still get a little bit nervous about. I don't get nervous about hardly anything. But boy, when you step out on the Opry stage, it's just a whole different ball game. It's, it's another level up. It's amazing. It's just, it's just wonderful. Any funny stories you remember that happened at the Opry or behind the stage? I mean, there's a lot that goes on. And oh, well, golly, there's a, a lot of laughing going on. People walking around. We visit each other's dressing rooms. You know, there's lines of dressing rooms. Hall, I've been behind there. Hallways. It's a lot of fun. And you stick your head in somebody's dressing room and slap them on the back, tell them you love them. And it's great. You know, one thing, a story, something comes to mind that I've always had... Uh, uh, at least a sax player, horns in my band, and always a sax player. And our, when we first started going out to the Opry, and I'm not going to say who was managing the Opry then, but I would always go up to him and ask, if I, I can I use my sax player tonight? And he would say, there's no horns on the Opry. There was a rule back then, no horns on the Opry. And then the next time I'd come, I'd go and say, can I use my sax player tonight? No horns on the Opry. And I came back, and I guess probably the third or fourth time, I, I, I always ask, can my sax player play tonight? T, there's no horns on the Opry, and if that policy changes, you'll be the first to know. So I remember that, getting scolded. Did but you? eventually they relax that rule. Did you bring them back on? Heck yeah, I have a sax on the <laughs> opera all the time. Every every time I go. So what was it like traveling on the road all these years? We've been everywhere the grass grows green. We've played every, it seems like every place there is to play. I don't know how many Miles, I wonder how many miles I've traveled. Millions. And it's just been, you know, at first when I was, when we had our son Acme, Sheila basically raised him because I was gone a lot of the time. So Sheila held down the fort. At home. How was that? I mean, it has to be difficult on well, relationships. I mean, hey, you and... know, I had to go make a living. That's the way I make a living, mainly, is singing, going out and doing shows. You get on the bus, and usually we leave at midnight. We roll at night. You wake up in the parking lot of some motel, hotel, back parking lot of some honky-tonk or arena, whatever, you know, we play all kind of, well, I mean, we've, I, I toured with Kenny Rogers for about four years in the late 80s and early 90s, and we played every major arena in North America. I heard some wonderful things about him. <laughs> he was so nice, you know, he was, he was the biggest star on the planet there, you know, for a time. Boy, he could sell tickets, like sell out every place. These big arenas, he could, sometimes we'd do a sun, two shows on a Sunday, let's say, a matinee and then a, he'd sell out the first show, they'd turn the house and he'd sell out the second show. It was amazing. And I, I was the opening act and, and a lot of the times they would have a middle act and it would be people like, well, Dolly, sometimes, Reba, uh, Glenn Campbell on a bunch and of And Linda them. Davis, we just talked to her. Her, Eddie Rabbit, Ronnie Millsap, just all these great stars that I got to hang out, hang around with and, and get to know. And I, uh, Glenn Campbell was so 
nice and talented. Just he did everything. I mean, he started out in L.A. playing in the Wrecking Crew, you know, that band that played on everybody's records. Then he was in the Beach Boys. Then he had this huge Glenn Campbell career. Great singer, great guitar player. And somehow I was goofing around and I found a clip on the internet of me singing harmony with Glenn Campbell, singing uh, uh, Roy Orbison's song, Pretty Woman. It was just awesome that that's on tape. And But anyway, Kenny was great. He was huge. He had a big jet, gold-plated everything on the inside of it. He had a tennis coach that traveled with him. He had a gourmet chef, but you know, he didn't hog the gourmet chef to himself. Everybody ate in the same room. The crew, our band, his band, Kenny, we all ate together. There was no Kenny playing a big star and all that. He was nice. He... Uh, I remember one time I complimented him on his clothes. Everything he had was custom made, everything. Pants, shirt, especially his jackets were very expensive and very well made, you know, custom, custom. I complimented him on his clothes because he always looked like a million bucks. And he traveled with, he had several tractor trailers, you know, back then, hauling equipment and First one thing and another, but he had a, a trailer that was nothing but a big giant closet of all his stuff. I mean, a ton of racks of clothes in there. And he said, just go get you some. So I got jackets now from him and I can still fit in a couple of them. So I wear them sometimes, but I got shirts of his and he was so generous. He was sweet to me, man. He loved me. He was, he was really complimentary. See, when I had a hit, my manager was the promoter of every Kenny Rogers show. So my first gig when I left, now I'd, I'd been playing these honky tonks and clubs in Athens, Georgia, for nine years. Then I moved to Nashville, and started singing demos. And very rarely would I perform live in Nashville, but I did the Bluebird Cafe. But then all of a sudden I was going from like the Bluebird, which is what, 100 people you can get in there? All of a sudden, bam, I'm opening up for Kenny Rogers. I didn't know anything. I didn't know nothing about nothing. They threw me out there in front of this huge crowd. I had to just totally make it up as I went. I mean, I had no experience, none, zero. But you know, that's what God does. He'll take somebody with no experience and bless him if you trust him. And we're gonna talk about your faith when we come back. Okay. T. Graham, tell me about your faith. I grew up in a Christian household. And my, my mama, mainly. My mama's side of the family really, really all in for Jesus, totally all in. Then my other side of the family, my grandpa, that side, they never went to church ever. But they were, you know, they didn't, they weren't uh, bad people. They just didn't, didn't go to church. I didn't grow up going to church on that side of the family. But, you know, I went to a little Baptist church. I got baptized when I was 11, but I don't think I knew what was really going on, you know. When you're baptized that early, I don't see how you really can know what it means. Grew up, and I kind of quit going to church for a long time. I always said my prayers, though. I was always a believer. I never quit believing. And I was actually scared not to say my prayers, you know. I went through all that crazy drug and alcohol stuff, and and uh, when I came out of that, I just felt really close to God and Jesus again. I'm I'm totally, totally bought bought into that, and you know I still say my prayer. I never, I don't think I ever missed a, a day of saying my prayer. Even when I was, you know, drunk and doped out, I still, I had sense enough to do that. You know, there's a story I heard about 
your song being played with George Jones. Do you remember that? Well, story? George and I were great friends and did shows together. He was one, hey, when I tell it like it used to be, which was my first hit, when, when they came out and we were touring around, I did a show in, in Cincinnati with George Jones at the Cincinnati Gardens. It was this big old cavernous place. And, and George, summoned me to his bus and it's, I was scared to death and that's the first time I ever met him. I mean he wanted to meet me and he was my hero and and we talked and it's probably it would have probably been on a weekend he said come over to my house on Monday and I'll take you to lunch we'll go eat so that's what started our friendship and that would have been I don't know 85 something like that so anyway, through the years, we're friends. We sang on each other's records and just, we did shows together and visited and we were just, he called me son. I called him my Nashville daddy and he called me son. And so we were big friends. And what you're asking me about probably is, this. I had this uh, album called Wine Into Water that came out in 1998. It was one of his favorite records and he told me that, uh, you know, he snuck off from the house. He wasn't supposed to be drinking, and he snuck off from where they were living out in Franklin, and it wasn't but probably three, four miles to the liquor store from his house. And he would sneak off and go to the liquor store, and I think he'd drink in the parking lot around back, you know, and, and get a buzz and then go back home, you know. That was just sneaking around. And he was on his way back home and he was drunk and he ran, there was a bridge in between the liquor store and their house and he ran into the, the bridge abutment on the side. It was a big old concrete thing. And tore his car up, you know, about killed him. He, you know, he was in the hospital a long time. But anyway, he told me he was listening to Wine Into Water, and he, he said, man, I had that wreck, and your CD broke half in two. He said, I had it in my, my CD player. So I think that's probably what you're talking about. And then Vestal Goodman, Goodman yeah. wonderful woman, you know, the Goodman family, great gospel group. I grew up on them in the 60s. I was watching them on TV. And our TV would get, be get, my brother and I would be getting ready for Sunday school, polishing our shoes with that liquid black kiwi shoe polish. It had paper spread out on the floor, newspaper, and we'd be watching the, the uh, Gospel Jubilee on the TV, getting ready, and the Goodmans would be on there. That's where I first saw them. So she'd pray with George, and she just led him to Christ at the end there. And uh, we were at the Ryman, Sheila and I, Sheila's sitting over here. Sheila and I were at the Ryman and, and visiting with Vestal in her dressing room. And she always had one of these lace handkerchiefs, you know, always hanging out. And she gave Sheila one of her lace handkerchiefs. We prayed with her. It was great. Beautiful. You know, wine into water, let me just tell you something. So wine into water, for people that don't know, wine into water is a song about getting sober that we wrote. It's a prayer to get sober. And so since 1998, it has it's turned into my signature song over all my head. In your cross. Right there? Yeah. It, 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 I've heard people say that was your biggest hit, and it never was a hit. It's just been passed around for, by word of mouth for all these addicts and their families, and it's just grown into this thing. And they use it at rehab centers, and they use it at churches, and it, it gets played in all these places. So I got a message just two days ago, and a guy, it was on Facebook, he messaged me and, and said, I'm in Missouri, I'm part of this group called uh, The Misfits, it's a recovery group, and, and uh, somebody asked me to sing Wine in the Water, and we did an altar call and sang Wine in the Water, and two men came up and gave their life to Jesus, 
uh, I just wanted you to know that your song did that. Now, ain't that, that is, great? It's a blessing. It's so imagine two people aren't going to hell. That's right. We have a minute left. What would you say to somebody listening right now? Well, man, gee whiz, uh, um, you got to trust in God. You got to you got to get your heart right and your head right. If your heart right ain't right and your head's not ready, if you ain't ready to to commit, it's never gonna work. You're gonna have fits and starts, just like me. I'd get on the horse, ride a while, and fall off. Get on the horse, ride a while, and fall off. Finally, I was able to talk to myself in the mirror and ask God for help. And from that instant, I never had another craving. So I know it can happen because it happened to me. So you got to get you got to get right and you got to be ready or it's not going to work. But when you get ready, just ask God to help you out, man. And great things will start happening. A whole nother world will open up to a whole nother world. I used to be so scared that all my fun was going to end. That's a common fear among addicts and alcoholics. They don't. One of the reasons they don't want to quit is they think all their fun is nothing's going to be fun anymore. Well, I found out just the opposite happens. I'm having more fun now than I've ever had. I'm aware. I'm present. I know what's going on, and that's the thing. Well, T. Graham, thank you so much. I'm going to be at the Grand Old Opry, hopefully, when you're in Yay! I want to be there to celebrate you. Yay, yay. Thank you for coming back. Oh, man, it's fun. Thanks for having me. God bless your heart for doing this. God too. bless you, too. My friend, are you struggling with addiction? Like T. Graham said, seek the Lord with all of your heart. He will help you get through it. He's right there. This is Today's Nashville. This is Faith. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.